Hey, Shab. It's Tim. Oh, hey, hey, how are you, sir? How are you? You look great. Uh, you too. Nice to see you. Thanks. You too, Shab. Great, great to be with everybody. Everything going well? Yeah. yeah. How, how's your family? Uh, doing all right. Uh, my older son Graham's uh, working at Yancey. Do you remember Yancey Caterpillar? Very well. Very yeah. well. Doing sales there, so he's getting Hello. married. Hello. Hello. Hi, Ovidio. How are you? Uh, Good for you. him, Shab. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for letting me uh, parachute in, Ovidio. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate <laughs> that you dedicated some time to, to watch us. In Thank this you. Thank well, I don't know if you know, I moved out of the business school. I don't know if you knew that. I saw you got you got the big chair. I'm so proud of you, man. Yeah, well, I got three jobs now. I so. saw, I saw yeah. How's it going? Are you enjoying it? I mean, these are tough times. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I came in at the... Hello, <laughs> come Graduate education is going great. Uh, enrollment, we're, we're up like 20%. In, wow, Shab. And doing in new programs, and that's going well. And, um, you know, international, <laughs> sports, but we're doing some interesting things. Um, that's great. Professional education, boy, that's, a, that's, that's kind of taking it hard because we it's have tough. a bunch of layoffs. And, I know. But we have a new um, facility at the Galleria. We're renting out for a few years. Awesome. So, well, yeah, but I got to come up with rent. If you want to <laughs> One of the minor details. Right? Yeah, they handed it to me. But it's all good. So how's Lauren? Good. She's great. I told her I was going to see you today. She sends, sends her best. Really, uh, you know, we miss, we miss so much seeing everybody. Yeah, and I really and I just got the message on, so sad, on Mike Curley. I was sorry to see that. Yeah, you know? it's very sad. Yeah, I just saw that yesterday, I think. And um, it's actually been... Several people around here, a couple ones you don't even know, new ones that people I'm sorry. have happened to, but um, Kat's doing great. And, Good. Yeah. And and how's Robin doing? She seems uh, to be doing all right? Outstanding. I mean, Good. I got to be under her for about eight months. Mostly when I worked on the accreditation, I led that accreditation effort for us. And, uh, right. And I left right after that, but she's doing an outstanding job. Good for you. Good, good. Well, give my regards to everybody, okay. and per particularly Kat, if you don't mind, and oh, yeah. and Cindy as well. Is she working at the university too? Cindy. Sure. Yeah. Reed? Reed? No, no. Your wife. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, she she, um, she uh, works uh, for Steve Small and Heather. She's a program coordinator for the MAC. Oh, great. Great. And that thing's nice. just, uh, you know. Unbelievable. They got a hundred percent placement. Everybody's getting oh jobs God. in the big four. And Isn't that great, great, Chef? Yeah. I'm so proud of you guys. It's really nice to see. Getting there. We hit we just hit forty two thousand students. So, it's astounding, right? Yeah, well, yeah. So good, I guess, but there's a lot of consequences to come with now. I, I know. <laughs> you know, I laugh, you know, Chef in in ninety there was sixty five hundred, if you can believe that. So uh unbelievable. Well, it's a whole different place here. It's uh bureaucratic nightmare but it's good <laughs> i guess we have to i know 
And, you know, and, and now we have to kind of measure ourselves with UGA and Tech and Georgia State all the time. So. Well, it's good company. It's okay. <laughs> good. And there's good leadership. So I'm proud right. of you, man. Congratulations. Whitten. Whitten's done a great job. She was the right person at the right time, but she's tough. <laughs> good. Okay. She's no nonsense. So that's yeah. what we needed, I think. Yeah. That's all right. Well, listen, at 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 a, at 345, I'm going to bail on you, but I wanted to be for, for the first part, so I hope that's okay. Yeah, and I think well, a video is going to go first, but I'll get in there. I'll right, right. Thanks, a video. Sorry to interrupt. I will be I will be short in order to to catch up with a uh, chef that will follow me. So uh, welcome to everybody to Masebus. Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, as you could see today, uh, we uh, wanted before starting uh, the new university year, in this very special year uh, that we were living in, uh, we decided to, to have a, a short event, just a, a snapshot about uh, uh, some points of view about uh, the, the business, about uh, some uh, uh, three points of view actually about uh, uh, microeconomics, about uh, macroeconomics, and uh, about marketing, customer behavior changing uh, within these uh, very challenging times. So, uh, uh, as you, as uh, we can take a look, so this is the agenda for uh, this afternoon. So uh, I will start with uh, with uh, some uh, uh, remarks, and I will introduce my uh, my colleagues that will join me in this afternoon. So uh, I'm Ovidio uh, Dambea uh, Kreza, director of Asebus, of this business school, for those who don't know me. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Professor Shep Tru. Professor Shep Tru is the Dean at the College of Graduate and Professional Education, uh, Associate Vice Provost, Division of uh, Global Affairs at Kennesaw State University. So thank you, Shep for joining us in this afternoon. Uh, and uh, uh, after Chef, uh, the presenter will be our colleagues Radu Krachun, which is uh, a macroeconomic professor and CEO of uh, BCR Pension Funds in Romania, uh, with an overview about macroeconomics uh, uh, issues and challenges uh, that um, uh, are affecting us uh, all. So, um, Let's, let's start. So uh, I will start with, uh, with uh, uh, my topic, which is uh, uh, mainly on microeconomics, uh, business, and uh, mainly finance, because uh, what I've seen in the last months um, after the, this uh, period of pandemic worldwide started, uh, it's uh, one of the challenges that, uh, and choices that uh, managers need to do is to watch out at their assets. Uh, we have, they have all kinds of assets, fixed assets, current assets. Uh, we were all suffering because of the supply uh, chain, the supply, uh, the supply uh, um, uh, deliveries of some basic products, some uh, uh, services. Uh, but what about fixed assets? So uh, people discovered the world, the business world discovered uh, immediately uh, after the pandemic and the lockdown period came that uh, uh, they have, we have a lot of uh, fixed assets that we don't use anymore or we use very partially. And everybody hoped that uh, in one month, in two months, this will end and then we will come back. Unfortunately, this would, didn't happen. Didn't happen, and uh, uh, it, it might take longer, as we can see already. So uh, we are in October, and uh, the perspectives are uh, are not very soon to change. Unfortunately, so because of this, uh, the longer the, this period is, the the more challenging it will be uh, managing your assets mainly investments, long-term investments, long-term assets that uh, uh, are the eating a lot of money. Uh, Everybody is having invested a lot of money in fixed assets that needs to, to generate money, no? to generate cash. 
So uh, that's why I, I wanted to, to share with you some thoughts regarding uh, uh, capitalizing on your own, own resources and investments. And uh, uh, starting with this, actually it's something not very new that we, many of us, we know and uh, uh, we saw for a few years already that uh, digital companies, digital company valuation are driven more and more by intangible, intangible assets and not tangible. Yeah? Which is something new maybe for some, not very new for others, but uh, uh, for sure during this period of uh, changing and changes that I was uh, talking about in terms of uh, what are we doing with our assets, are, you, are we value them at the maximum capacity or not? Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a question that any and each of us we can ask ourselves and then we should make some, uh, some decisions about it. So uh, uh, I, uh, I saw in the Harvard Business Review an article that you, you can take a look. I will uh, share with you uh, this presentation. So uh, this is means uh, uh, in the last years, we could see an increasing return to, to scale on intangible investments. Yeah? Intangible investments become more and more important and more and more valuable in the economy of, uh, of the businesses. So because of this, basic financial statements needs a lot of uh, uh, reconsiderations because these intangible, actually, uh, as long as you are expenses, you, you are expanding uh, investments, intangible investments, then you have more expenses, much more expenses. You can record losses, yeah? But those losses are not reflecting the reality of the business. So this is one one weakness of income, income statements, but also the balance sheet, uh, it's, having, uh, it's having some weaknesses because of net not capturing uh, the reality of the value of intangible assets. Yeah? So uh, there are already terms like uh, market leadership, uh, network effects, winner take all, profit structure or web traffic, uh, strategic alliances. So there are some things that are intangible, but they are very, very, uh, they are uh, getting a lot of value for companies. But this value is it's pretty hard, pretty difficult to, to count, to measure, and to transform in a, in a, a valuation when you want to, to make a valuation of a business. So uh, that's why uh, it is a challenge already for, uh, for accountants, for auditors, and for business valuation people, specialists, in order to capitalize these intangible investments, uh, because otherwise we can ask ourselves why Google or Facebook are valued at so many uh, thousands or uh, hundreds of thousands, billions uh, dollars, and Many times they are showing in their uh, income statement, they are showing losses. Yeah? So this is the reason that, that uh, because some uh, the, the basic financial statements should be uh, re should reconsider their way of uh, looking and making financial analysis of the businesses. So uh, uh, in terms of trends, we can, we can look at uh, uh, corporate balance sheets for are more knowledge driven, by the way, the intangibles. Yeah? than fixed assets driven. And uh, a recent research uh, done by uh, uh, some companies are showing that uh, SP500 uh, indicator uh, are showing that 84% of the assets are now intangible. 84% of the assets of SP500 companies are intangible assets. Yeah, so this is confirming the, the huge change as a, as a trend, uh, not just trend, but already there are facts that intangible assets, uh, assets uh, knowledge driven are more and more important. They already have the dominance in this. And uh, uh, how to maximize this value in the future? So it's, uh, first of all, we need to understand what it means intangible. So intangible, it means much more than simple goodwill. 
We all know about goodwill, we learned about goodwill, what it means, so something tangible, but uh, this goodwill should be enriched in the last period because there are, there are more things here like uh, uh, just a summary, summarizing intellectual property, business rights, brand value, public rights, uh, hard, there are hard intangibles like software licenses, uh, uh, internet domains, uh, some other parts of goodwill, proprietary data, uh, non revenue rights, uh, relationships. So uh, it matters a lot the relationship that you have with, with your suppliers, your customers, yeah? exclusivity rights, and things that we know about, but we should be more aware that all of this. Uh, are bringing more value or not, depending on your habit or not, and uh, depending on this, you can you can uh, monetize them or not necessarily. So, in order to monetize them, you should maximize them, and also to to uh, we should learn how to find out ways to to measure it and to to show the value. So, there are a lot of companies. More and more companies in the world that are, the, are the maximizing value, investing in these intangibles, in knowledge driven uh, uh, assets, uh, that means finally it means what? It means a new role of people and professionals in the economy of companies. It means company valuation, we all now we learn that it means cash generation. As long as the company is generating more cash, that means it's, it's valuing more, <coughs> it's valuing uh, uh, more. But uh, again, it's a matter about fixed assets, hardware versus volatile assets, which, means, which are, as I said, software, platforms, algorithms, AI, machine learning, whatever. So all of these are created by people, by professionals, yeah, by very specialized people, so that's why uh, it is important to have very well-trained people, very good professionals, managers, managers, and uh, uh, specialists, but usually managers to, to, that are able to be, to be agile, to, to think open, out of the box, and to, to learn how to adapt and the changes very quick, very fast. Uh, as Radu, my colleague, was, was writing also in, in some articles, very nice articles that he was writing, so uh, Radu will, will talk uh, more about this at the macro macroeconomic level. So, uh, but also at, at micro, uh, for uh, for uh, Asebus graduates and uh, uh, students, uh, you learn already about uh, uh, the writer of uh, our uh, financial management textbook, Robbie Higgins. That's it saying what? And he was saying this many years ago, not necessarily now. So he was saying many years ago that the, the most valuable assets of the companies are going to light home at their spouses. Yeah? So there are people, there are professionals that uh, we need to invest in yeah, in order to, to maximize our profits and maximize our business. And like a, like a, a conclusion of, of my short presentation, is that uh, uh, similar to, to digital companies, the acceleration of digitalization, which is happening now and we, we can see it, yeah, we can touch it, we can do it, uh, it will speed up the trend for uh, intangible uh, knowledge predominance, whose uh, value creators origination, it's the value of the people and of course the company values, yeah, by the way, vision, vision and, and other things. So with this, I, I will end this and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I hope that I, I uh, wait some uh, uh, questions for you. So we will be waiting for, for the questions on the chat. And uh, then I will let uh, uh, Shep, Professor Shep, uh, to continue with uh, his presentation. Shep? Oh, hello. Thank you. Please. Oh, well, good afternoon. Good morning from here in Atlanta, Georgia. It is certainly uh, an honor to be here. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sure. We hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> good morning. Yeah, it's, it's certainly an honor to be here. It's always a, a pleasure to work with our partner, Cebus. Uh, you know, Kennesaw State has been partnering with them for over 20 years. Uh, in fact, uh, Tim Mescon, who's in our audience uh, today from ACSB there in Europe, uh, 
helped forge that relationship 20 years ago at Kennesaw State University. And um, I, I see that some of our alumni from the Boost are in the audience today, and I'd like to say hello to them. Uh, you know, this is certainly, uh, you know, an interesting time for all of us to be in. And, uh, you know, we like to say unprecedented. We hear that word a lot. Uh, and how, because there's so many unknowns. Um, but, you know, today, I think one just create a discussion on how we might address those uh, unknowns. Uh, one of the things that we teach uh, at Kennesaw State and our Coles College of Business, as well as at Asebus, is the importance of asking questions as opposed to trying to jump right to the answer. Uh, because as we've learned, you know, asking the right questions gets us to the right answer. Um, you know, the path forward for companies now is, is more critical than ever. Of course, we've had unknowns in the past, but you know, researchers, companies uh, over the years have uh, used the, their experience, data to create strategic models and the use of technology uh, to be able to understand uh, consumers better. So we can predict how they receive communication, how they process it, uh, and that leads to their purchase behaviors as well as consumption. Um, and what we've learned really is that most markets and most situations uh, change evolutionary uh, pace, not on a revolutionary pace. Of course, there's some uh, exceptions to that. And I think Romania is a great example and perhaps uh, something we can all learn from your experience in the past of, of rapidly changing markets as the economic system changed. Uh, but still companies over the world for the last you know, 10, 20 years have been used to moving at, at a slower pace and finding you know, opportunities, green fields, blue oceans, um, through diving in data, but really just using past behavior. Uh, so in the last, you know, six months, my discussion with companies, um, our academic researchers, reading articles, and just my observations, uh, I think the common thing that it all comes back to fundamentals, uh, which is a good thing from us from an academic perspective, because that means our models uh, uh, really uh, can stand the length of time. And so as I've read through the articles and talked to people, it seems like three things kind of come out um, as a consistent pattern. If we look at something from Michael Porter, like situation analysis, uh, this is something we always have to do address, right? And on, on a daily basis, regardless of the crisis or lack of a crisis, how consumers behave based on the situation. Uh, and you know, most everybody's familiar with uh, Michael Porter, uh, but there's one, um, I wouldn't call it a classic, and I don't think it's gotten the, the attention that it deserves. But there was a book about 10 years ago by a man named Neil Martin. Um, he wrote it, it's called Habit, the 95% of behavior that marketers ignore. And really, you know, the fundamental learnings from that is that consumers um, act out of habit. Uh, they make their choices through habit. You know, I think the, one of the examples he gives in, in, the, um, in, the, in his, his research, a typical U.S. grocery store, has about 30,000 brands in it, but yet the typical American family only buys about 300 brands total. Um, and so we know that there's no way that consumers make an evaluation of 30,000 brands that are sudden 300. Um, it's a function of the situation that they're in, and then they form habits. And we know that habits, of course, means that we're really not thinking. It's a surrogate for thinking. We, we do something uh, at a routine because there's so much to process. And this disruption, uh, that we've had here in the last six to eight months is really on everybody's habit, on our routines of how we shop, how we consume information uh, and what we're buying. And so we can use those, I think, as really fundamental models to look at these uh, critical choices that we have to make, uh, which brings me to, I think, you know, this title of today's session was Critical Choices for Leader. Um, and, you know, I, I love the word choice. Uh, you know, strategy is the most common term probably used uh, in industry, in academia, in business. And we throw that word out there quite a bit. And there's a lot of great definitions for strategy. It's a path forward. It's a direction, a destination. But the word I really like is choice. Because uh, strategy is, is a choice. Because when we kind of frame it as a choice, we imply that it's a decision, a decision path that has consequences. Uh, and, and those consequences are trade-offs that consumers make. And those trade-offs have to be consistent. They have to fit with not only our core values of the company, what we have to offer, um, and, and the value proposition that we provide, but also with the consumer, with the, with the marketplace's situation. And again, back to that the concept of situation. And so those are the kind of the three things I think that we need to look at to figure out how do we make sense um, of this new, new world that we're in. And uh, there's a lot of articles written here in the last six months, uh, H in, 
Harvard Business Review, uh, Fortune and others, and you know, addressing what companies are doing now um, and really looking also back at crises or disruptions in the past and how companies have reacted. So I think there's a, a great you know, model, a template to go look at. The one that really stands out to me that uh, I guess I'll uh, give a shout out and promote today uh, is an article that just came out a couple of weeks ago by McKinsey and Company, and it's about the next normal. And so I'm going to provide uh, Sebus and Bianca at the end of this uh, a couple of uh, recommendations of articles that she will send to all the uh, participants today. And if you had to read one out of all of them, um, uh, I would pick that McKinsey article because it addresses what's going on today. The other one would be The Habit. What really the McKinsey uh, article talks about is how the current global crisis is changing how consumers behave across every aspect of their lives. And I think that's really the key difference today is that we've seen change, but it's, we haven't seen change to this degree uh, all at once. Uh, it's, it's a broad impact on our lives, of course. How we work, where we work, when we work, uh, in my business, where we learn. Um, and not just learn perhaps in, from an academic or education standpoint, but how we learn as consumers. Where do we, how do we consume information and uh, how do we process it? Uh, because we know that how people consume information and interpret and process it is a function of that environment that they're in, uh, how they share information with their, with their peers, their friends, uh, even people at work uh, to, to help determine their opinions. Uh, a lot of that's been taken away because we're in this isolated space now. Uh, even though we might be communicating virtually uh, with our colleagues, with our, uh, our family and our friends, it's, it's a whole new normal. Uh, for that for us and we're not quite sure how to um, to process that of course the impact goes on our shopping patterns uh, it's what we're what we're buying how much we're buying uh, the change in brands uh, living at home even our play and entertainment our travel mobility and of course um, you know our view on our health and our well-being all these come into play and really shape uh, the, the way we make decisions um, and, and, and in terms of purchasing products uh, so what we need to do, I guess, is, as an industry or across industries, is get a better understanding of how consumer habits and preferences are changing. Because again, if we, if we buy into the principle that what we buy is through habit, really without through thinking that much, because we just can't, we don't have the time to process every purchase we make, um, habits really shape our behaviors. And if our habits are being disrupted now, we can't do the routine that we've done for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years of our lives as consumers, uh, we've got to look at how this isolation and economic uncertainty, uh, of course, there's a lot of people who are out of work uh, or worried about their future, uh, but there are those who also have extra money because of lack of, uh, lack of uh, expenses or changes in their expenses in, in certain areas, and they've transferred that, as we see a lot of winners uh, in, in this industry as well, because people now are spending more money on different things that they didn't pass. Um, just try to buy a refrigerator in the U.S. Uh, or an appliance. Uh, we went to buy one the other day, and it's six, seven-month wait. Um, I'm buying a golf cart, golf cart for my wife, and uh, those prices have shot up from my look eight months ago, uh, $3,000, which is about a 60% increase. To, and it's just due to demand. Again, basic supply and demand principles. So really the short and the long-term kind of game strategy that we need to look at is really dependent upon understanding the impact of the situation that we're in now on consumer behavior during this crisis, but even more so, how will it change behavior in the post-crisis, in the new normal? Uh, and that's where you know, companies need to be looking for that long-term win. Uh, right now, we're making adjustments to figure out what people need now. But I think the lesson that we need to learn is how is this going to impact them uh, six months from now, a year from now, and when, when hopefully COVID is under control, um, how are we going to revert back to our old uh, habits of, and routines of, of purchasing? Probably not. Some will come back. And the key is to figure out which behaviors will come back, but what have been changed permanently? Uh, in, my, in my industry, of course, education, it's a very unique uh, situation to see online education and the struggles we have with it, but yet there's a lot of positive coming out and I can see our, our model changing uh, as that changes for restaurants, movie theaters, uh, and then both people buying products that have been passed that they had to touch and feel uh, that they don't have to do anymore. Um, from buying cars, to buying clothes, buying groceries, 
have we seen an increase uh, in those no touch, uh, safer uh, means, means of purchasing, this is bound to have an impact on us and, and how we want to behave because what we've seen is that we find more time uh, uh, available for other activities if there's less time uh, taken up during shopping uh, because we can do it through, through the internet more. And uh, if, if that purchasing process, if that information search process is shortened, uh, the communication that companies need to do is now heightened. It's more important to get your message across uh, because consumers are not really out there comparing in, uh, competitors' products in the same way. And uh, we need to figure out how this new normal uh, will affect the consumer experience, uh, affect their needs, uh, the values that they have. And of course, this is going to be something that's really a function of uh, the segment that you're targeting, uh, because we know that not everybody's homogeneous. Uh, most segments, in maybe just two general ways we could start with, just based on the country uh, that you're targeting, because uh, using Porter's PEST model, you know, political and economic and social situation for countries is different because of how they're reacting uh, to this in terms of health and safety and the approaches they're, they're taking, balancing that versus open markets. Um, and then of course, I think generations, uh, is, is generational segments are key to look at. Uh, I, you know, I look at myself uh, in terms of using technology and, and consider myself to be somewhat uh, advanced and progressive using technology, but yet I'm old, you know, I'm 58 years old. Using technology is uh, not a great way for me making a connection. Uh, uh, it's not a relationship building uh, process for me. I've had too many years of needing that in-person experience. Uh, and that's probably, you know, a fairly safe assumption across an older generation. Uh, no matter how much we use it, we just can't uh, connect to it. I tend to think of my, uh, my niece's daughter, so my grandniece. She's seven years old, you know, and she lives about 15 hours, probably about 3,000 kilometers from me. And, um, you know, once a month I talk to her on FaceTime. And I know she talks to her grandmother on, on FaceTime probably once a week uh, through the internet. And, you know, to, and I enjoy that experience, but at the end of that phone call, while I'm happy I spoke with her, to be totally honest, it doesn't mean a lot to me, right? It, it's not really a relationship to me uh, because I want to be there and, and kind of have that interaction. But to her, that's a real relationship. That's all she's really ever known. Uh, this is how relationships are formed and how she connects. And of course, with marketing, connection is a key term. It's, that's how we make a connection. That's how we, we sell our value proposition to others to convince them to give our product a try. And so I think about her from seven years old to my sons who are 24 years old. This is all normal to them. Um, and so, you know, the McKinsey model talks about the new normal uh, because of the crisis. But really, this new normal has been coming along for the last 10 or 15 years uh, with the advances in technology from iPhone, um, Skype, uh, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and so forth, is that this is how people interact now. Relationships are formed this way. And so I think in the next year, the next 10 years, 15 years, to them, the, the way we've done business in the past of wanting to connect with somebody in the store, um, in-person uh, relationship, uh, has been changing this global crisis has really just accelerated accelerated this, this process um, you know and, and those companies that are able to adapt and able to look look ahead and understand it's going to impact them and how they change their model are the ones going to be the succeed so what we've got to do is kind of quickly adapt to this new consumer behavior that i think covid19 has accelerated um, you know and again I think questions are, are the key to ask um, and to, so we can get to the right answers. And so I was thinking about what questions uh, we should be asking, uh, regardless of the industry. In. And I started out with, um, you know, how was the consumer's experience changing? You know, what do consumers value now? The value of time and convenience. Uh, convenience, obviously, a very American type of um, attitude that that's pr prevails in, in consumer purchasing. Um, how is it changing our value? What we want to do with that experience? What do we want out of our products? So how are our habits changing? Uh, because of this new normal that we're in, you know, we have to have um, new, new ways of shopping, new products that are available. And what we're seeing in the data is that people are trying new things. They're trying new products and they're breaking those old habits. 
one, they're being forced to because products aren't available, uh, or two, they're, they have more time to search perhaps on uh, the internet to compare. And of course, with companies like Amazon, that'll send you a new product to try out for a few days. And if you don't like it, you can send it right back. And, and this is changing the habits um, of consumers, their routines. And so we've got to ask ourselves, how are they trying new things? What are they experiencing? And what new competitors for our dollar, for our, for our, our monies, are, uh, are, are, are active? And the second question I really wrote down for myself was, how do consumers get information now? How is this changing? Uh, you know, there's a, a change in the access to information and how we seek for it and really how we process it. And so how are we comparing the information if we can't really have that verbal uh, interaction, if we can't have that visual interaction of others buying products and what are they buying? If we're not going to their homes, if we're not out and about, we don't see what others are purchasing. And as we know in marketing, that really has a huge impact. There's, uh, of course, marketing and advertising has an impact on what people buy. But one of the most important factors is what we see our peers, our aspirational groups purchase. Uh, and if we are isolated, uh, we're not seeing that. So that means that we're processing information and making decisions in a different way. Uh, next, uh, I wrote down um, where and how do consumers purchase products? How is that changing? What new channels are they using? Um, you know, Amazon, of course, is still dominating, and uh, at least in the U.S., and growing. But as more people have more time and they get more experience with shopping uh, online, searching online, they're finding out that there are other companies out there available selling products online that they can do, they can, they, they can try, uh, that perhaps are uh, less expensive or offering different uh, options. So what is this shopping experience like uh, if couples are not shopping together? Uh, if friends aren't shopping together, how are they shopping in the home? And it could be more of an isolated purchase, sitting on your iPhone, sitting on the computer. And that, that exposure to that information, if it's just in an isolated perspective, it loses the interactions. And those interactions of what we have in our knowledge database uh, over the last 20 years, understanding how consumers shop. And finally, what are consumers purchasing? Are they, are they rebuying the same products? Are they trying new products? We've seen an uptick and people buying higher end products um, because uh, they're shifting the, the money that they're saving in other areas, uh, money they're saving on, on gasoline, money they're saving on dry cleaning, money they're saving on going out uh, to home improvements, product improvements. Um, and how is this a check affecting their, their quality perception of brands? Uh, and of course, the quantity of what people are buying. And so I think I'm gonna leave it at that so we can get to, to the discussion area of you know what we need to do now is act to shape a more positive future uh, companies have plans right now of course everybody has to figure out how to adapt to make sales in today's market uh, and this change but the real i think um, winning ticket is that the companies are asking the questions on how will the future be shaped how will consumers be six months a year from now and so i'll leave it for that discussion about what questions are you asking right now? And what should we be asking right now to kind of win the long-term uh, bet on this uh, crisis? Thank you. Thank you, Chef. Very interesting uh, uh, comments and uh, challenges regarding uh, nowadays and the near future. So uh, uh, by let uh, people to, to think about it and to, to come up with, uh, with questions at the end. So uh, up to then, I will invite uh, now uh, Radu, Radu Krechun, our colleague, and graduate about uh, teaching macroeconomics. So, uh, and Radu, let's see what, what you have today uh, to share with us, please. Hello, everyone. Well, uh, I think that our video just did a terrible mistake uh, because Usually when you have such an event, uh, you want the last person to be the most positive one. Because you want everyone to be left with a good taste, you know, after such an event. Uh, um, I can only think about, uh, you know, a party when everybody feels well and is partying like crazy and they want to suddenly open all the champagne bottle and then a guy uh, comes and says, stop, stop, stop everyone. Nobody opens champagne tonight. Let's open it next year. Of course, it will be the most hated person in, uh, in the, the room. And uh, 
probably I'm going to be the one. Um, what I want to, uh, to invite you, I'm going to invite you to caution, basically, because uh, I think we are, uh, we are living a pretty misleading uh, context. Um, if we look around us, what, uh, what we do see, for instance, we see high growth rates, high growth rates when it comes to consumption, to GDP, you know, we see an apparent sudden recovery of the, of the whole economy, very high growth figures, and uh, this tends to be very encouraging, isn't it? We see stock markets uh, posting all-time highs, you know, uh, very, very spectacular growth in the stock markets, and uh, everyone being mainly buying stocks and asking uh, himself or herself how high it will go, it will go tomorrow. And we see as well governments and central banks talking over and over again about V-shaped recovery. V-shaped recovery, everyone is dreaming of the V-shaped recovery and uh, this is what uh, they are trying to, to sell to, to consumers and to, to the business uh, environment. Well, I think we should not uh, be carried away by all these uh, signals because um, uh, make no mistake, and here I'm going to, to quote the chief economist of the, of the World Bank, who says that we are in a pandemic depression. Of course, people are scared of the word depression, everyone tends to avoid the word the depression, it sounds so bad, it goes back to the 1930s, and uh, we know uh, what tragedies occurred at that time, but uh, actually, if you look to some figures, you'd realize that we are uh, we are living uh, exceptional times. Uh, for instance, if you look to the unemployment in US, actually it's, uh, it's a double digit unemployment and it's the highest figure which the US has witnessed in the past 72 years. On the other hand, if you go to UK, the Bank of England mentioned that the uh, economic decline uh, which uh, UK is uh, likely to face has never been encountered since 1706. So these are the times we are living and we should be, we should be aware of them. Now I'd like to, to refer a bit to the three variables which I, which I mentioned. Uh, I was mentioning high growth rates, I was mentioning stock markets, and I was mentioning the, the shape of the, of the recovery. Now uh, about the high growth rates, um, be them consumption or GDP growth, one has to be aware of the following. If there has been a 50% economic decline, in order to go back to what we used to have, it's not enough to grow as well by 50%. Okay? So in order to recover a 50% decline, you have to grow by 100%. What I mean is that even if the growth rates in percentage terms look spectacular, actually they are not large enough yet to bring us back to the situation before the pandemic. It's pure mathematics, it's not uh, a big deal. Um, actually, uh, the chief economist of the World Bank, uh, Carmen Reinhardt, was saying that looking to the previous deep crisis, on average, the time required in order to go back to the pre-crisis situation was about seven to eight years. Okay, now moving, uh, moving on to the, to the stock markets. I think that the stock markets uh, these days are in a rather absurd situation. Uh, they are totally decoupled um, compared to fundamental, economic fundamentals and uh, actually I think they are as well in the dark, themselves and investors alike. We have uh, right now a absurd situation which companies like such as Hertz, the uh, current in company or JCPenney, despite asking for, uh, for protection against bankruptcy, um, the next day after they asked for protection, the stock price went up uh, significantly. Uh, we are in a situation in which for the first time probably in the history of financial markets, Hertz, after asking for protection against bank bankruptcy, uh, was able to uh, decide to make a public offer of 1 billion shares. And guess what? Many people were interested to, to buy. 
uh, why it's absurd? It's absurd because, on the other hand, the bonds of the same companies are traded as if, as if they would default. And of course, shareholders will be the last to, to get their money back. But apparently, stock prices are, are going down. Actually, we are seeing a situation, I'm talking about stock markets in general, in which investors are actually desperate to put their money in something. Uh, on the interest rate on the T-bill market, uh, they are uh, witnessing a, a very strong uh, financial depression, uh, meaning that actually you can no longer make money investing in fixed income instruments. The interest rates are uh, negative in real terms. So actually what we are seeing there is pure uh, wealth destruction. So under these circumstances, the only tool left available, although it's already obviously a huge bubble, is the stock market. And everyone wants to invest in the stock market in order to be exposed either to tangible assets or intangible assets, as uh, Ovidio, Ovidio mentioned. Uh, obviously, it's a situation triggered by uh, another uh, desperate measure taken by the central banks, according to which they print a lot of money, money which actually have no coverage in terms of services or, uh, or products. This will be a short-term solution. Uh, central banks are willing to prevent at any cost a freezing of the economy and uh, let's say a freezing of, uh, of the banking system. Uh, but as I mentioned, I think this will be a short-term solution for which probably there is no other choice but it will be a short-term solution which will bear significant medium and long-term costs. And actually the medium and long-term costs, which I have already mentioned, is the wealth destruction mainly of the population. Because you know the ordinary people uh, are not able to save in the very sophisticated instruments. They usually save in bank deposits or they save in, uh, in treasuries. Uh, and all these people, looking medium to long term, they are going to lose money. They are going to lose money as well via the pension funds, which, uh, let's say, are mainly in those countries where uh, interest rates are, are very, very low. Fortunately, it's not just the case of Romania, and uh, we hope it will not be the case, but if you look to the US, to the Euro area, um, Pension funds over there have a, have a tough time because uh, fixed, in, fixed, fixed in income instruments are not providing real, um, uh, positive real interest rates. Um, these days, of course, uh, many people look to the price earnings ratio when they talk about stock market. But another interesting indicator is the price sales ratio, which tends to be probably more stable because we, we know profitability tends to be more volatile and uh, sometimes we have uh, you know, very smart accounting, which is window dressing uh, figures. But usually if you look to the price to sales, uh, you know, um, a figure which historically has been quite unusual was a ratio of 10 times, a rather unusual figures. Well, these days, 530 of the 8,500 listed stocks in US have a price to sales of more than 20, okay, of more than 10, sorry, of more than 10. Moreover, the market capitalization of uh, the US stock market uh, versus GDP is of 200%, which is an all time high. Uh, what has triggered this? If you look to the structure of the, of the stock market, the tech companies have been the main drivers. Uh, it was enough to have, uh, to be exposed to digitalization or to uh, electric vehicles or to cloud. All these were buzzwords which ended up in triggered fresh money on the stock market, new investors willing to, um, uh, to put money in these companies. And of course, we, end up with a, we ended up with a, with a bubble in the technology sector. Um, the third uh, thing I was, I was talking about was the shape of recovery. So uh, we are under, let's say, an intense uh, campaign coming from a decision maker telling us uh, that uh, recovery is going to, to be, to be this shape. Is it? 
Well, a VG recovery means that actually what, uh, what we should expect is that after a steep decline, there will come uh, another steep uh, growth of the, of the economy. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, actually, in order to have a perfect uh, V-shaped recovery, after a decline of 50%, uh, you are supposed to have a growth of 100%. Um, to be honest, it's hard to believe that this would be the case. Uh, therefore, uh, the alternative to this would be an italic V, in which basically the second part of the V, the, um, right half of the V has a less steep uh, uh, trend compared to, to, to the decline. But again, this would mean that in a rather short period of time, we are going to go back to the uh, situation before the, before the pandemic. Um, so I tend to, to be cautious with this, and I think we are not there yet, and I shall explain a bit later why. Uh, another letter that they used in order to try to predict the, the shape of the recovery is the K. Uh, the K uh, has basically two halves, it's the upper half of the K and the lower half of the K. And actually, uh, by mentioning such a, such a letter, uh, those who use it try to refer to uh, two economic sectors, actually. Try to split the economy into different sectors. Uh, one is a sector who benefited a lot from the pandemics and uh, which saw basically their turnover rising, uh, they employed new people and uh, the profitability went up. And of course, here we had those uh, sectors who benefited from uh, our uh, stay-at-home uh, uh, work and uh, style, uh, style of living. And then uh, you have the, the lower half of the, of the K where uh, we, could, uh, we could include the sectors which were heavily hit by uh, what happened. And we could easily think here about uh, tourism, about uh, hotels, uh, about uh, transport, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, actually, it's a, it's a letter used in order to um, reflect the diverging uh, trends in the same economy uh, where uh, the use of an average tries to miss, uh, is uh, supposed to miss that uh, under that average you have diverging, diverging sectors. Um, the last uh, letter used for the recovery and um, actually um, I think uh, it, was, uh, it was mentioned more recently by uh, Krugman and uh, as well by uh, Mohamed al -Ariyan. It's uh, the square root, the square root sign, in which, um, again, you have uh, the first uh, part, which tends to be a B decline, and then you have a, a rising part, but which does not go back to the pre-crisis situation and stops before reaching that level after which we have a flat, uh, a flat line, meaning that the recovery is going to be only partial and uh, for a while there will be uh, a zero growth. So the recovery will be not is, as easy as um, some have anticipated. Okay, why is that? And this is um, the last part of my presentation I want to talk about. So why uh, is difficult to back, go back to where we, we used to be? First, it's about the fact that we still have the threat of a second wave. Now we feel it uh, more and more, you know, the heat is going closer to us and we see a significant increase in the, in the number of cases. Uh, despite this, uh, I think it's unrealistic to believe that we are going to see another total lockdown of the economies or of the countries. Because I think we are uh, a bit smarter, we are more able to, to deal with the uh, virus, we know what needs to be done and uh, how to avoid, uh, let's say, exaggerated uh, reaction. Um, so I don't think we are going to witness a total lockdown, but uh, a selective one could be the case. Um, 
we are going to um, see, let's say, as well, probably some time needed in order to get a vaccine. So the time to, to have it done, to have it finalized, then of course it will be quite difficult to have everyone making, uh, made, it, uh, made it available to everyone uh, because uh, there are also a lot of money out uh, there and uh, it will take some time to have everyone uh, vaccinated. And the last and not least important question will be, uh, will it be good enough? Because um, of course, as we know in the situation of the ordinary flu, uh, in times, you know, viruses tend to uh, uh, have mutations and then the uh, uh, vaccine might become no longer appropriate even before everyone was uh, vaccinated. A second reason for which uh, we should uh, be cautious regarding the economic recovery is the capital destruction which has occurred and will continue to occur during this, uh, this period. The European Commission has estimated that in EU the value of losses in 2020 uh, is going to be 720 billion euros. This is the amount of losses which companies are going to face. Moreover, and probably this is even, uh, is even more um, tragic, is the fact that one quarter of the companies employing more than 20 employees would exhaust working capital and will have no longer cash. So basically these companies will, uh, will be in a diff very, difficult, uh, very difficult situation and we will be on the brink of uh, bankruptcy, basically. Very difficult for such companies to recover. Actually, undercapitalized companies first will be in no position to invest in the future because they will lack the cash to do so. And second, others will be captive to debt servicing. So they will spend all their profits in servicing their debt, prolonging basically their uh, suffering up to the moment when they will become insolvent. So these are the, say, the challenges as regards you know, the undercapitalization and um, the fact that uh, the recovery is going to be uh, pretty painful. Um, what is threatening as well, because you know governments are there providing a lot of money, subsidies in order to protect businesses as well. But actually this could play in the wrong direction because by subsidizing, subsidizing everyone and sometimes in the wrong way, might prevent some companies to die. Uh, although that is said, but some companies no longer have a reason to, re to exist. And actually the key of the economic recovery will be as well to channel resources towards those sectors who have a future. Not to channel resources towards sectors who will have no future. That will be money spent for nothing. The third reason will be the export plunge. And actually uh, here the World Trade Organization estimates that the global trade will fall by 13 to 32% in 2020. So assuming that the right figure is somewhere in between this interval, actually it will be still the worst year from, 19, from early 1930s. So this is the, the, how tremendous the export decline is. And one has to bear in mind that actually, if you look back to the 2008 crisis, at that time, uh, despite what was happening in the developed world, China was still growing. So the Chinese economy was still growing and actually that provided a, a, a boost, a support for the global economy, which is no longer the case. Um, which will be the uh, economies which will suffer more? Of course, the export-driven economies, but here we find a mix of both emerging economies and developed economies. Because on, on one hand, we have you know, export houses like, such as Germany, uh, which is a technology exporter, which will suffer a lot. You have as well here service exporters, and here I'm thinking about uh, countries which are uh, tourist destinations, which will no longer be. And I'm thinking as well about commodity providers, and here, you know, Middle East, for instance, is a typical example, oil exporters, gas exporters, uh, and, and so on, which will suffer as well. So we have uh, three types of countries, both developed and emerging, which are going to suffer from, uh, from, uh, from this. 
Uh, another reason is the persistent unemployment. So uh, uh, we have to be aware, some businesses will never open again. Some people will never be employed again. Some other people maybe would be able to get a job, but would get a lower qualified job compared to what they used to do, because what they knew and what they used to do is no longer uh, appropriate. Um, so graduates will find uh, in a job uh, to be very difficult to find. Uh, graduates might be less, less prepared than the previous cohorts just because, you know, all this uh, digital uh, education was not accessible to the poor layers of the society. So not every kids in the countries will be able to access digital education and therefore these people, will, these kids will be condemned to poverty and to low qualified jobs. And I have to say that not only poor countries, but even wealthy countries will not be in a safe position because we see them now spending a lot of money on social welfare, but this money will have to be paid back. And this money will have to be paid back from the future revenues, from the future budgets, which will have to be dedicated to paying debt and not to economic growth. Two more reasons are the rise in polarization between countries and within the countries. And actually this means that there will be less consumers around for uh, the suppliers of goods and products. Consumers basically will no longer be there. And the last but not least important factor, and I think currently probably it's underestimated, is the lack impact of the current context on the banks. Banks have not dealt so far with bankruptcies, have not done, um, dealt so far with bad debts because uh, businesses and people enjoyed all sorts of uh, subsidies and uh, favorable uh, um, legal framework, allowing them to postpone their uh, installments for credits, uh, companies enjoying subsidies, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, the worst is still to come for the banks. So probably uh, 2021 will be a much worse year for the banks compared to 2020 because only then, you know, the emperor will be seen as naked and the economy will show its, uh, its weaknesses, which uh, will mean that actually we are going to see more personal defaults, we are going to see more companies defaults, and yes, we are going to see more sovereign defaults than uh, we, have seen, uh, we have seen so far. Um, so I will end here, here and uh, the statement with which I, I would like to end is the fact that uh, a rebound uh, such as the one we are witnessing should not be taken as an economic recovery. Thank you, Radu. Uh, yes, you're, you're right, actually. I, I think uh, I was uh, uh, wrong a little bit when I let you uh, uh, at the end to, to make this analysis. But the analysis, it's, uh, it's a, a very good analysis and uh, of the reality. So it's good to, to face this and uh, uh, to address it, uh, to think about it, uh, to be as long as we are more aware about uh, the challenges and uh, the changes uh, in this uh, world at the microeconomic level, in the international level, then uh, we have time to prepare and to, to get solutions and uh, um, ways to get out, to, to uh, make surviving and again uh, restarting, uh, developing uh, uh, the businesses that uh, we and uh, our uh, our graduates and uh, our students are uh, working in. So uh, uh, already I, I see a, a question uh, from Paula that uh, if we can predict what the impact will be uh, in the next five years, maybe we we can uh, we can uh, come here. So can you adjust this with the camera? So just, uh, just a second to uh, sit for uh, more questions and uh, for a chat. Yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I, I think uh, here it's it's a quite absolute answer. And actually, I mean, I can reply with another question. The, tell me if you are going to have a, a, a good vaccine in, in, uh, in five years. Um, here I came across a um, very nice term, which I uh, liked a lot. Uh, I think it was brought by uh, Mohamed al um, He was saying uh, that we are not, no longer exposed to financial counterparty risk as they used to be in the previous crisis. We are now exposed to the human counterparty risk uh, because nobody trusts the other one. Uh, yeah, I, I have to uh, sit uh, two meters away from Ovidio because I don't know if he is uh, in full shape or not. Uh, I hope, I hope yes, yes. <laughs> I wish you. Uh, and uh, the same happens all over the place. So right now we are facing this human counterparty risk. And as long as the human counterparty risk will continue to exist, our behavior will be, will be totally, totally changed. Uh, another point here, you, know, you see, including the National Bank of Romania and other central banks cutting interest rates. Well, this is an excellent PR exercise, in my opinion, because central banks show they are doing uh, whatever they can in order to pump the economy, but it's useless. I don't think that everyone who is scared to get out of home uh, will get out of home just because interest rates are lower. Okay? Interest rates can be as low as they want if the person is scared to go out and shopping, that is totally useless. So uh, this is a typical measure for a normal uh, economic cycle in which we have a normal uh, recession, uh, and then the central banks cut interest rates, we have a fiscal stimulus, blah, blah, and so forth. But cutting interest rates in this environment, of course, uh, is of some help, but definitely we will not, uh, not uh, make miracles. So, um, to, to end my, uh, my answer to your question, what will happen in five years' time? It will depend to what extent in five years' time we are going to still be afraid of uh, human uh, counterparty risk. Well, thank you. Uh, I see a, a question from uh, Anka. Uh, so she's asking about uh, how do we prepare uh, the what are the new leaders, skills? the new skills that we are the, um, looking for the, the leaders of the businesses in order to cope with, uh, with these new challenges that uh, uh, everybody is seeing that we have. So uh, I can start answering at, at this question. Uh, what we are doing is actually, uh, to, first of all, to, to make uh, our students and uh, our graduates uh, more aware about this new normal of the changes that uh, we need to, to face it, and then to look at, uh, at solutions. So uh, uh, one, uh, one thing that uh, we are doing is to, to go more and more uh, on digital. Uh, actually, we, we have uh, one uh, uh, new course since last year, before COVID coming, about digital transformation. And uh, we already have uh, uh, Romanian case studies about uh, how digitalization uh, got into the uh, in banking businesses and uh, in other businesses, how people uh, uh, make more efficient their businesses, um, introducing uh, digitalization, uh, algorithms, platforms, and all kinds of things in order to, to become more, uh, more efficient and to uh, do what I showed also at the very beginning in terms of investing more in, uh, in intangible assets, in uh, knowledge-driven assets rather than, uh, than fixed assets, that it seems that this is, uh, this is uh, uh, also already the present, not necessarily the future. Then it is also important that we are doing it in our uh, classes in finance and uh, macroeconomics to, to make people aware about uh, the, the bad things that are happening worldwide uh, in order to protect their businesses and to, to make the right decision uh, in order to, to survive and to further develop into the new normal that, uh, that we have. So uh, um, if you can, if you want to add something, Radu or, or Chef, maybe you want to add something. By the way, our, uh, our uh, cooperation and working together our students yeah, 
Uh, I think it's a great question and something that, um, you know, students, uh, potential students of a CEBUS and any executive MBA program should ask, right? You know, how is this going to benefit me? And I, I really believe in what a CEBUS does um, because I, I would put it in two areas. One is uh, CEBUS, the way, you, the way it's, the program is taught there in the Socratic method, it's about discussion. It's about interaction. Uh, we can all read articles on our own, right? We can see what's happening by reading in the media or, or industry trade. But the opportunity to process those, uh, what's going on, the data in the world, with uh, the faculty of Asebus, with uh, the students at Asebus, all right, on a weekly basis or daily basis as a group meet, uh, to really get different perspectives, because that's what an education is all about. That's what learning is about in industry, right, is is bringing in different information. So I think that that's one that SABUS does. And what really makes SABUS different, I believe, um, for many universities uh, in the U.S., but I think particularly in Romania, is uh, the extent of the network that SABUS provides. Uh, and the, the large alumni base, uh, I think you might have the largest alumni base in terms of executive MBA, I believe an MBA in Romania. Um, and so those alumni participate, right, in, in your classes. And they speak, they teach, they're bringing in what they learned in the, in the school, but they also learn on a daily basis in their executive jobs. Um, also the partnerships that Cebu has, I think with Kennesaw State, uh, but with also other universities around the world that uh, Cebu's partners with, and just brings in a very diverse um, set of speakers to present an idea, but not just to present the idea, but really for everyone in the classroom to discuss it, to ask the right questions. And, and I think that's what I've always been impressed by Cebus. And, you know, I work with a number of universities around the world and I think they do a good job, but I think a Cebus, what they do is a great job of really trying to get multiple perspectives, not just a Romanian perspective, not just a European perspective, uh, an American perspective as well. And, and that way, individuals can, you know, interpret and process that information and figure out how it applies best for them. Yeah, what frustrates me as regards uh, macroeconomic books is they tend to be very, very academic. Okay, so I'm not an academic myself. I'm a CEO in pension fund business. And I can tell you that uh, probably 70% of what you can see in a macroeconomic academic book is of no use when you go back in your office, okay? So this is the advantage of me teaching macroeconomics, the fact that I give people what they need when they go back in their office, okay? So they are able to understand what the governor of the central bank is saying, I, I can understand when they read Financial Times or um, Wall Street Journal or whatever. Because in these magazines, you do not see, you know, curves of supply and demand. You, when you're in your office, you're not supposed to calculate this kind of stuff or, uh, you know, different uh, other uh, very sophisticated macroeconomic indicators. But you're asked to understand very basic things, you know, what drives for forex markets, what are, which are the monetary policy tools of a central bank, and, and so on and so forth. And, and therefore, I think it's, it's important for people when they leave the macroeconomics course to, to go back in their offices and suddenly to, to be able to understand much more than, uh, than before. Yeah, I, I think you are, you are right, Radu. And uh, actually, uh, I think it's very challenging nowadays to, to write a textbook about uh, any of the, of the economics or the uh, business administration field. But uh, uh, as, as Chef said, and, and thank you, Chef, for, for the, your appreciation that uh, I take it like from, uh, from the uh, Kennesaw State University, uh, uh, because uh, uh, we have a long-standing uh, cooperation and uh, uh, you are representing actually the, the university and especially the course College of Business. Uh, but I would, I would add uh, uh, two more things. Uh, one of it is that uh, the fact that uh, nowadays uh, managers, leaders in, in businesses should be very agile, very uh, fast thinking and decision makers. Uh, by the way, the, the changes and the unexpected things that uh, uh, are coming. So uh, uh, um, in order to, to cope with this, uh, we introduced also since last year uh, a, new, a new course uh, about negotiations. 
that Simona uh, is, is doing quite well. Actually, our students can, uh, can confirm. Uh, and uh, I saw Simona also attending uh, uh, today. So hello, Simona. Welcome. So it's, it's an excellent course. And the uh, uh, second thing that I want to add is that, uh, for example, I I'm, um, experienced for the first time uh, last year uh, the real evaluation of each of the companies that our uh, students are working for. Actually, uh, at the final uh, exam in, in financial management in our course, I just uh, uh, challenge the students to make their business valuation for the companies they are working for or uh, if they are the, their own companies. And uh, there were some excellent uh, works done by, by our students. And even more, uh, I was really impressed in, in April, I think. It was uh, uh, this kind of work with the first year students for financial management course. And they already made the valuation in two scenarios, uh, without COVID and with COVID. Yeah? Because the, the virus is already was there. So on the 16th of March, we uh, got into lockdown. So one month later, when uh, it was ending the financial management course, the first year EMBA students, so uh, they made the valuation of their businesses and they already had two scenarios of business valuation. And uh, it was very interesting to see that uh, some estimations, some valuations affected their estimations of the business valuation for their businesses from uh, from uh, uh, simple to double. I mean, already since April, our students were uh, uh, able to to see the business value of their companies they were working for uh, could uh, reduce at a half their value because of the uh, COVID influences that will come. And we all know that uh, in, in April, we hoped that uh, uh, this pandemic uh, period will end in, in maximum few months and not in uh, uh, next year. Or the, we don't know exactly, by the way, what you said, rather with, uh, with uh, B, italic B, and uh, uh, square root. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, it is something that uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, most probably uh, feasible and reasonable to, to think at uh, nowadays. So we will see what will be for the future. So let, let's see other, other questions. Uh, if there are not other questions for the moment, uh, I, I can, uh, I, I have actually uh, a lot of questions. By the way, uh, 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 the stock markets, the, the, the interest rates, the predictions and the bubble actually uh, where uh, we are because of this printing money. Actually, that's why I, I read again uh, the article that you wrote uh, uh, one month ago, I think, uh, with uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, the store with printing money and the fact that uh, um, the very bad consequences that uh, uh, are happening uh, because of this. Uh, so the article, it's, it's uh, uh, really interesting, uh, somehow scary. But on the other side, so we, you already underlined also uh, uh, today uh, some points about this. So uh, uh, coming back at the, at the businesses and the small or medium-sized businesses at uh, our uh, audience, our students, our uh, um, graduates, uh, some friends, prospects that uh, are attending to this uh, um, meeting. So how, how, what do you, would you recommend to, to the managers uh, managing their businesses? Uh, how to, to cope with this uh, not just uncertainties, but also with these threats that uh, it, it seems that they are very reasonable, that uh, good analysis done by, by those who you cited them and also uh, through your, uh, your uh, thoughts. So how, how can we prepare our, uh, our uh, um, guests to, to uh, minimize actually the, the impact 
effects of, uh, of um, these threats, which are not uh, uh, nice prospects for the moment? Well, I think there are a few suggestions we can make. Uh, first and foremost, and probably the most important, if possible, stay liquid. Stay liquid. Okay. And try to preserve your working capital, don't allow it to, to disappear and take the necessary measures, adjustments, uh, cost cutting, whatever, in order to, to remain liquid. The second suggestion would be, if you need money, don't rely too much on credit. Okay? Because in Romania, credit is hugely popular. Actually, you know, banks have some kind of monopoly in funding the economy. But please bear in mind there are other ways of funding your business as well with equity not with, with credit. There are, you know, uh, uh, investment angels, there are private equity funds, and uh, it's, you have to search a bit. Don't go for the easiest way, which is a bank, because then you'll uh, pay forever your, uh, your interest to the bank. Uh, third suggestion would be uh, try not to fall in love with what you've done so far because that might no longer be appropriate in the new circumstances. So try and step back and have a cold-minded assessment of the business you had so far and, and its future. Uh, and try to understand to what extent it is realistic to assume that at some point in time it will come back or that actually that it's only a dream. Moreover, you could even ask a third party to have this look if you think you are too much in love with it and try to have with a fresh, uh, fresh mind and assess the future of your actual business. And of course, link to this, chase new opportunities because this crisis, I think, is offering uh, opportunities as well. And you, if you have to reinvent yourself as an entrepreneur, uh, do so and then try to find new opportunities. Okay, thank you. Actually, uh, I would add uh, as, a, as a finance uh, person that uh, uh, there needs to be to be make some decisions with no emotions. By the way, uh, cost cutting and uh, uh, firing people and uh, things like this, they are not pleased for anybody, but uh, uh, when you need to do it, you should do it in order to, to, to save your businesses. On the other side, I, I would uh, like to add, in terms of, uh, I totally agree with you, in, in terms of uh, uh, financing, there are uh, various ways of, of financing uh, a business, even though we don't have a, a great history in Romania with this, but uh, uh, we can learn. And uh, uh, what I've seen, and actually there are uh, two of our uh, uh, valuable graduates that are doing, uh, they, they already did a platform for crowdfunding, for example, for startups. That uh, uh, they, if you really have a good idea and a very good business plan, then you can, you can go and access this, uh, this way of financing, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, something new in, in practice in Romania. I was teaching actually about crowdfunding uh, uh, at uh, international finance. Of uh, course, but uh, uh, this is happening already also in Romania. So there is also this uh, uh, way of financing for startups that uh, who will be interested in uh, can, uh, can access also this. I'd like to add one more thing, uh, and it's about people, about your people. If you decide that you need your people, if you decide that you have to rely on the future for your people, then show it to them. Because I came across companies which during these times behave worse with their employees than they were behaving before the, the crisis. And I think it's a terrible decision. Actually, uh, in these times, people are more sensitive to any decisions you make regarding themselves and they appreciate even more. And they will tend to be uh, grateful for this later on. So if you need your people, then treat them uh, with even more respect and care than uh, you did. And pay for trainings. Get them uh, to, to trainings, to MBAs, because... It's an excellent as, time for training. Exactly, as you, as you have seen, so uh, intangibles and uh, uh, knowledge-driven assets, it's, it's the future. You can read from home? Yeah, that, that's right. 
So uh, I have I have also a question for for you, Chef. Uh, by the way, the the uh, American uh, consumer behavior nowadays. So we all know, I assume that uh, uh, you Americans uh, are very very uh, how to say a great consumers. I mean, I mean it's a it's a very consumption uh, country. When people like to, to uh, consume a lot of things and uh, maybe also waste uh, um, some of the things that you buy. Actually, we have also this tendency. We had, uh, because probably it's not valid anymore, but we had also the tendency. But you have a, a great history in the US of, uh, of a consumption society uh, buying a lot of things, a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, Irrespective, you you really uh, need them or not? Maybe in the future, so store them to be there. So, what what can you tell us about uh, changing? Is is it changing this behavior somehow in the last months because of this period and maybe also for the near future? Yeah, well, uh, we definitely consume a lot. I know you've met my wife, so that's why you you have a, a good. Uh, <laughs> Perception of what we do, she's very typical. Send my regards to her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, you know, I guess in our defense, consumption keeps the economy going, I guess, uh, but there's a lot of negative consequences, of course, environmentally and uh, and uh, socially and, and, and otherwise. But, um, you know, what's really happened here is, you know, of course, the people who are out of work and they don't have money, have less money, of course, they're going to be consuming less, All right? But, um, you know, what we've really seen, I think, is uh, for those who haven't lost their job or have only had a small reduction that we're continuing to consume. Um, you, know, you lock the Americans up for a few months uh, and we're shopping online. Um, people are spending money on different things. You know, uh, there, it's been a big, you know, some industries that get hurt, right? Dry cleaning, gasoline, uh, restaurants for a while. But, you know, as restaurants open up in the U.S., people are been doing the takeouts, uh, spending more money on, on, on that, uh, more on home improvements, right, uh, from appliances to in entertainment. Um, and, you know, there, I think there's a big bubble waiting to, to explode for, for tourism, right? Americans really want to get out. We see whether we should or should not be moving out, we've been doing it, and we'll see an increase. Um, for better or for worse, and probably more for worse, cons Americans want to consume, right? Yeah. Uh, we want to consume and we will continue to do that. Now, hopefully there's some lessons learned, right, in terms of um, consumption. But companies are, some companies, this has been a, you know, a big, a big huge, a huge increase, right? Um, alcohol sales, right? You know, um, whole, things for the house, uh, tourism is coming around, uh, hiring products. Uh, Amazon's doing a great business. It's it's a, it's a cultural thing, you know. Why do why do Americans consume a lot? It's part of our culture, right? It's part of the. You can trace uh, it back to the 19, uh, trace it back to the nineteen late nineteen forties, early nineteen fifties, after World War Two, right? So, the economy in the U.S. takes off, and consumption really becomes part of the uh, the, uh, the marketplace uh, for what we do. You know, consumption is about convenience, about collecting. Um, you know, but there is a new generation coming up that's, um, while they've been, uh, I, I'll use my boys as an example, 24 years old. They, of course, they've been exposed to consuming and they want to consume. But I think it's uh, starting to take a turn. Uh, they're, they're a more global generation. They're wanting nicer products, maybe not as many, but they're, they're spending just as much. Um, but uh, wanting higher end products and spending more. That's... I think well, America's not to consume, the world's going to have to fall apart. I see this with, uh, with my teenagers as well, and actually this is probably a surprise for, uh, for many producers, because this young generation tends to be more uh, cautious in consuming. They want to reutilize things, they ask themselves if this is really needed. Uh, um, they drive less, of course, because now they have all these uh, technological uh, appliances, applications, and uh, I think the youngsters tend to be more uh, consumption prone than uh, their parents and grandparents. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, again, consumption in the U.S. Is, is part of a culture. Culture changes slowly. Culture never changes rapidly over time. Um, 
I think you're going to see consumption to continue in terms of the levels. I mean, just the, the logistics or the economics of, uh, of a global market where you can buy products cheaper and cheaper, right? Um, uh, increases consumption. And that's, I've seen that in Europe in the last 20 years, right? People consume more just because more products are made available cheaper from a global marketplace. But what's changing is what people want to consume. I think the new generation has different needs and different wants. Uh, for what they're willing to spend their money for um, you know credit is still widely available which is very much an american you know culture thing and it's so it's not about how much we're going to spend it's what we're going to spend it on and that's what i think we're seeing in the last eight months even the old generation what we spend it on um, as your life changes as your life becomes more just in your home or in your smaller area um, and how and how you consume and use products so it's more about what we'll consume not if we will I think the if is there, for sure. I was reading already two years ago the number of driving licenses in US uh, was declining among yeah. youngsters, so that they are less keen to to drive cars than uh, yeah, exactly. the parents it's amazing. because they will they will come with the self-driving cars. So yeah. They don't need to drive the car. Two years ago there was no self-driving car, but of course they had Facebook, they had uh, other means to get in touch with the other. They, they didn't have to drive. Yeah, I mean, that's the key. You know, when I was 16 years old, you know, everybody I knew went on the very first day of your birthday to get your license, you know. And, you know, I look at my children and their friends, and there's plenty of kids I know that are 18, 19 years old who don't have their driver's license, which is just was unheard of years ago. And I think the key is why. The key question is why. And in the past, you had to have a car to get somewhere. Now you don't have to go everywhere because of technology, Uber. And, you know, the shifting of um, where Americans live and how we live more, uh, even in the suburbs, people live in areas where you can have everything available. You don't have to go downtown to have culture. You don't have to go downtown to have uh, options, uh, to shop, uh, to have fun. And so it's just more readily available because, again, it goes back to convenience. And, and, and I think Americans want things now and they want it uh, convenient and, and where they can interact. and. I, I have I have one more question now because uh, by the way this context that we are talking with with changes changing some behavior especially at the young generation uh, who are uh, uh, more selective also I mean they don't need all, all kind of stuff and this is as you said uh, mostly uh, probably because of the technology and the many services that have developed. Uh, in, in the last period, so they have everything they, they want uh, according to the new times that we are, uh, we are living now. But uh, in this context of, of changing generations and, and some uh, uh, behavior pattern, how, how do you think uh, the, the brands, so the question is about the brand, yeah? The, the big brands, the recognized brand, uh, worldwide, so you Americans, so you have uh, uh, still most of the uh, strongest brands in the world in, in various uh, industries. So, how do you think this these brands will will survive in order to to maintain their uh, their reputation, their uh, recognition, and of course, uh, uh, finally to monetize on it as they they did up to now? Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, you look at another demographic fact in the US, um, uh, people in their 20s now um, are living more at home with their parents than they have in the last 30, 40 years. Um, and so that's been a big change. Usually, you know, kids left the home in the US at, you know, 20 years old, they were out on their own. But now they're living at home, which means they have more disposable income, right? Uh, they have more disposable income to spend. And be that follows to the brands because if you have more disposable income, you have more choice for a higher end brand. Um, this generation is more adept uh, at comparing products across, uh, you know, uh, online. And they actually see more products that their friends use because it's on Facebook, Instagram, and so forth. They're sharing what they got. And those brands now have to infiltrate, be a part of that uh, social media discussion. Uh, that takes money, right? And so it's the bigger brands that have that opportunity. Um, you know, a smaller brand, while the internet allows you an opportunity to be more exposed, you've got to compete really against uh, what it costs to get in there. And so, you know, it's the same in my industry in terms of universities, our, our model changing. Um, 
people are rethinking about where they go to school and particularly if you're going online, right? And so what are you getting? And it, there's a threat to the smaller schools, those who have high costs. And so brands that have, can maintain their costs but still get their message out, I think are gonna have a better chance of surviving. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chef. So other questions? We said, we see, we, uh, we have a question from Valentin. How can we measure value destruction? Can we correlate with some macro indicators? May there be some different inflationary trends across markets slash industries? Well, actually, value destruction is, is about what extent the, the value of, of your wealth is uh, preserved over time. And in order to be preserved, actually, it has to grow at least by the inflation rate. If uh, your value is uh, the value is not uh, growing with inflation, rates, so the return you have on your wealth is not equal to uh, inflation rate, then actually the, the return is negative in real terms. And this means that actually the value of your wealth is, uh, is going down. And uh, actually, to be pretty, pretty tough to, to, to be able to preserve it. Uh, you see now a lot of interest from gold, for instance, these days, because people hope that gold will uh, you know, be a safe haven uh, preserving the value. And actually, the gold has been performing uh, very well in the past six months. I think it went up by 15%, and in the past five years, by about 60%. Uh, but again, uh, gold is, is volatile, it is not a, a safe bet, it's more like an insurance policy in, the, in bad weather. So it will be tough to, to find uh, such, uh, such investments uh, which will preserve your wealth. This is why everyone is piling up in the, in the stock market, hoping that it will be the silver bullet or the golden bullet, if I'm to refer to gold. Um, and uh, here we end up with a bubble, and we see bubble on the stock market, we see bubble on real estate again, people chasing assets and no longer being interested to get the, the, the money, the currency, the paper, uh, the prefer to invest in, in uh, assets such as real estate, but again, in real estate, you have a bubble. And the question is, what kind of real estate? Because again, you see, including in in Romania, people no longer being interested in the flats, uh, willing to, to stay in uh, houses, uh, maybe in the suburbs, and uh, you might end up with an empty apartment if you buy such a, such a thing. So it's, uh, it's a tough choice, and I don't think I have the, um, the golden solution here. What, what, I, what I would add to uh, uh, Valentin's question is that, uh, uh, so it, it's not, very difficult to, to measure the, uh, the destruction of a business. Actually, uh, we are just looking at, uh, at the, uh, by the way, what, what you said, Radu, earlier, with uh, an, uh, a more, more uh, uh, interesting indicator nowadays, price to sales versus price to earnings, yeah? because earnings are much more volatile. So then uh, you look at price to sales, but there are many other, uh, many other indicators that uh, uh, you can you can look at, and actually, if if uh, you are uh, uh, heavily affected uh, uh, at your sales, so that's already it's it's a destruction of the business. So I mean, uh, you, you just need to look at uh, how to how to conserve your clients, your business in terms of sales, in terms of business development, because uh, otherwise you, you just uh, see how how your business it's uh, it's gone. Then. Uh, uh, um, on the other side, uh, um, as, as we all know, and I've also mentioned about uh, liquidity, having liquidity, but also this liquidity should be carefully monitored because if you stay with, with too many lay uh, in, uh, in your uh, uh, deposits in, in the bank, uh, they, they might uh, lose uh, uh, from the value in time if uh, inflation is it's, uh, it's getting up. So then also probably we, we need to do it with some rate to do something with those lay. Uh, in the worst case, uh, maybe putting in the, in the hard currency and not necessarily dollars, <laughs> by the way, uh, what also Radu wrote uh, a few weeks ago uh, uh, about changes in, in hard currencies uh, in the world and uh, a lot of changes. 
but still it's it's good to have a balance actually among all the things and uh, the, the, uh, the current assets the liquidity it's good to be closely uh, monitored and uh, uh, corresponding to the to the sales to the business that, that you have so uh, uh, watching with one eye at the macroeconomics what the decisions uh, uh, are to be done at macroeconomic level what the government are, are doing and then uh, try to, to uh, secure your business uh, uh, according to the knowledge that you have and already to, to, with the experience that you have. So also Viorel, I see uh, that uh, it's asking what do you think it would be the right decisions that governments should take to decrease the impact of current crisis? Uh, okay, I shall take that one, but before that I noticed, uh, I noticed another in, uh, interesting one uh, which I'd like to take, and that there be some different inflationary trends across markets industries. Uh, first, let's go back to, to basics. Uh, inflation is about consumer prices, yeah? CPI, Consumer Price Index. Um, so this is what uh, it measures. It measures the changes in consumer prices. Um, Strangely enough, isn't it? Despite all this money printing, we do not see too much inflation around. Um, which tells us that actually inflation is not only related to, to money supply, it's not only related to the quantity of money which are around us, but there is a second variable which is key, and uh, this is money velocity. Okay? So the speed with which money are changing hands. And actually, right now, the money velocity is very, very, very low. Why is that? Because people are scared. When people are scared, they don't spend. When people are scared, they save. They put money aside with the metrics, in the bank, wherever. So money velocity is very low. And therefore, central banks are so courageous in printing more and more money because they know that money velocity being so low, inflation is going to be low. Okay, when you talk about consumer prices. The problem is that actually if you want the inflation is manifest in other areas and I already have mentioned these areas. Inflation is manifest on the stock market, but the stock market is not in consumer prices. It's manifest in real estate, but the real estate is only marginally present in, in consumer prices. So all this money which have been printed, they didn't go into consumer prices, but went into real estate and stock market. Why? Because these are the money used by the wealthy people. Wealthy people have enough money for consuming, uh, for consuming for, uh, consumer products. They are not going to eat more. They are not going to buy more clothes because they already have those. So they are not eager to spend more. So they have some excess cash with uh, which they are investing in other areas, which are not part of the consumer basket, which is the um, stock market, which is real estate. Uh, by the way, you now 90% of the stock market investments come from 10% of the U.S. population in the United States, which shows that actually, you know, the money printing of the central bank, unfortunately, uh, didn't help everyone, but helped more than uh, others than, uh, than the rest, and not only U.S., uh, all over the place. People who uh, were in a strong financial position, which were, were owners of businesses, actually, took more benefit for central bank money printing than uh, the rest of the population. So from this point of view, this was another big disadvantage of the monetary policy of the central bank, the fact that they contributed to the social polarization of, uh, of different countries. Now, if I'm to refer to the second question, what should the government do? Well, government is in a very tough position. Honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to be part of the of the government, of any government uh, these days, because they have to make tough choices. And in Romania, the choices are even tougher because the budget is much, much smaller. So less money available in order to be spent around. Um, of course, you see uh, every each day uh, business associations coming to the government asking for subsidies for their uh, economic sector to be, uh, you know, uh, funded and subsidized by the government. And so, so this is not realistic. Uh, some businesses, unfortunately, will have to die. Uh, some associations will lose some of their members. Some associations will be losers in their bid to the government. And I think this is inevitable. So uh, the government will be in a definitely different, very difficult position to decide who deserves its money, even more so in Romania. Where the money will be money wisely spent and where the money will be spent in a foolish way. 
because they will not produce any results in those businesses which are condemned to, to fail. Okay? So uh, from this point of view, I think the government should be courageous enough to make all these tough choices, to, be, uh, to have the skills and the professionalism and the right people in order to assess which economic sectors deserve to be protected and uh, deserve to be uh, subsidized and uh, supported and which have to be left to die. And uh, as in the case of you know, the doctors, uh, deciding to leave someone to die in these times is a very difficult decision. Okay, so other questions? It seems that there are no uh, other questions. Uh, any final comment? Share our friend that it's still morning in the US. So any comments yeah. at the end? Yeah, I still have a long day ahead of me, but so, I mean, I mean, again, just thank you very much for participating today. It was an honor to be here. Um, I think discussions like this are, are critical um, to get people thinking about the future. Um, you know, it's, while it is a crisis and we like to use the word unprecedented, um, you know, there are lessons to be learned from the past. I sent some articles to Bianca uh, that she can forward on to the participants about the lessons from the past as well as uh, some observations of today. Um, I think the key is to just look at short and long-term, you know, strategies here. The short term is how do, how do you make a sale now and cut costs to survive today? But how do we prepare for uh, post-COVID post in, in a new environment? And, uh, my, you know, I'm sure Bianca will provide my contact information when she sends it out. So anybody send me a question. Um, and uh, I don't think I can answer them all, but I think I know a lot of people I can forward it to to, to, to answer it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Chef. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for your attendance and uh, uh, for uh, being with us this afternoon. So uh, we, we can do the, also some other uh, similar meetings in the future. So thank you, Radu. You're welcome. And, uh, You're welcome. Uh, just uh, one last mention. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I just want to tell everyone that uh, actually in my microeconomics course, I uh, speak much less than I spoke today. <laughs> actually, the students are doing my job. So uh, be aware if you, if you plan to, to come. On the other hand, if you think macroeconomics is not sexy enough for you, because although it should, in my, in my opinion, uh, we are preparing all together uh, a course on, uh, on crisis management, and I think these days crisis management uh, is definitely uh, sexy for, uh, for everyone. And uh, I hope to, to meet you on, uh, on our crisis management uh, course, which I'm going to do. Yeah, actually, actually I, I'm happy that you mentioned this, and I, I'm sorry that I forgot. To, to say that uh, actually you, you came with, uh, with the idea, with the proposal for a few months and uh, so you are working at uh, this kind of course. So we uh, uh, really uh, invite you uh, to, to attend this course. It will be a, a unique course uh, taught by, uh, by Radu in the following weeks. So, so just, uh, just watch uh, uh, our uh, program. And uh, maybe Bianca, if you want to, to add something regarding uh, this uh, new course that Radu will have. So it will be not uh, within the, the program of uh, EMBA, it will be uh, separate for the moment. Yeah, it will be about the crisis I went through and about the crisis other went through. And uh, of course about the crisis you went through. So I think it will be a lot of sharing uh, because uh, these days, is, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, so easy to go through a crisis. And it's already on the website, and to, you are going to find out about it starting tomorrow. And you'll be having also a, a course about uh, branding, no? Yes, and a course about uh, strategic branding that will start uh, in a week or from today. It's also uh, promoted already, and uh, it's... Uh, Done, uh, it's held uh, by an international professional who lives and works in uh, Belgium, Alina Papa. Highly recommended. It. It's also a new course. Okay, so we have uh, we prepared new courses and uh, we are waiting. We are still having some uh, some places 
for the uh, MBA and the MBA for this year that will uh, start in a few weeks at the end of October. So if you have friends and uh, neighbors and uh, people to whom to want to have the same language and understanding of business from macroeconomics to micro and uh, everything else about the business, so you can, uh, you can recommend to enlarge our, uh, our uh, uh, community of people that uh, uh, we uh, talk to each other and uh, try to, to do our best for the businesses, for ourselves and uh, uh, for the future. So thank you all. Thank you very much and see you uh, with the next uh, our occasion. Bye.